In this video, we're gonna talk about how to tackle any medical ethics scenario. I'm gonna teach you all the knowledge that you need to know around medical ethics. And at the end, where usually all of the good stuff happens, I'm gonna give you my four-step process for answering any medical ethics scenario. And I'm gonna give you the number one key tip that's gonna make sure that you smash any scenario. Hello, and welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name's Dr. Ash, and this is the channel where we help you along your journey to medical school to make sure that you get into your first choice at the first attempt. So firstly, we're going to talk about what kind of medical ethics scenarios come up, how to think about medical ethics and my four-step process to tackle any medical scenario that comes up from an ethics point of view. Then we're going to be looking at the pieces of medical law that are relevant to ethics. And finally, I'm going to give you my one and only tip to smash any ethics scenario that might come up in your MMIs. So what are the common scenarios that you could get from a medical ethics point of view in your MMIs and panel interview? Well, here are some of the four most common ones. You could get this, 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 or this. But also, you need to know a lot about hot topics. These are current, controversial, or maybe famous cases that have occurred in society that have maybe made the news and caused debate amongst doctors. So just keep yourself up to date with all the medical happenings in the world by maybe checking in with BBC Health or the student BMJ to make sure that you're on top of everything. So think of things that have caused debates, controversy, or maybe even legal changes. Most likely for this year's interviews, it's going to be all around COVID. So how do we approach ethical scenarios? Well, I want to introduce to you is something called the four pillars. Now you may have heard of this and think that it's maybe some sort of legal thing or known thing in the medical world, but actually all it is is a framework for how to approach medical scenarios. So I don't want you to think of it anything beyond just a list of things that you need to think about when you think of something from an ethical point of view. So we'll go through the four pillars now and I'll explain a little bit around each. The first is autonomy. Patient's autonomy means that they are at liberty to make informed, uncoerced decisions about their healthcare. It means that they have the right to make decisions about their life and their care, and we must respect that. However, not every patient has the autonomy to make decisions about their care. And this is usually related to issues surrounding capacity. Now we're gonna talk about capacity a little bit later on in this video, but if you want an in-depth video about it where I go into it in a lot of detail, I recommend that you check out this video here. The next pillar is beneficence. What this basically means is that we should always aim to do good by our patients. So after looking at just the first two principles, we can see that situations might arise where these principles clash. For example, we've already looked at autonomy and beneficence, and the classic one where these clash are when a Jehovah's Witness patient comes in, they've had a traumatic injury and they're losing blood. And we're left in the scenario where we want to do right by them because we want to give them the blood that they need to survive. But at the same time, their principles and their right to choose says that they don't want the red blood cells. So there we have a clashing situation and that is a classic medical ethical scenario that comes up. So after this video where I've talked about how you can tackle any medical ethics scenario, I'm gonna actually release some scenarios and we're gonna talk through them and go through my four-step procedure for exactly how you should handle them. The third pillar of medical ethics is something called non-maleficence, and that essentially means do no harm. However, it's almost impossible to do zero harm to patients. Any tablet that you prescribe has the potential for side effects. Even things like taking blood, they do hurt, but on balance, they are for a net benefit to the patient. What we're essentially saying with this principle is that we should avoid any unnecessary harm to the patient. The final pillar is around justice. And what this is essentially looking at is, are our actions compliant with the law and the rights of the patient. This might be looking at things like advanced directives where a patient states ahead of time that if they should be incapacitated in certain conditions, what they would and wouldn't want to happen with regards to their health care. So this is a legal document that's drafted up by a solicitor and it might say something along the lines of maybe if they were severely injured and kept alive on a ventilator that they wouldn't want to be kept alive artificially beyond a certain point. That's just one of many possible examples for what they might say. Another document might be something called a DNAR and that is do not attempt resuscitation, which is a document that when a patient reaches a certain level, we deem that it's not worth attempting resuscitation should their heart stop. I'm actually gonna talk about it in another video that will appear here in a few days where I talk about this in a lot more depth. One question I get asked all the time is, what do you do if the patient is unconscious with regards to advanced directives or their autonomy or their justice? Well, in that circumstance, the doctor has a right to act under what they call the best interests of the patient. The other element of justice 
justice is asking whether our treatment is fair and balanced based on a societal perspective. So let's say, for example, a patient has abused their body and needs an incredibly expensive treatment. Is it fair to give them that treatment where we could use that same money to maybe treat 10 other cancer patients? And this is especially poignant in a national healthcare system like the NHS. Okay, so now that we've looked at the four pillars of medical ethics, we're going to look at the key pieces of medical law that are relevant and you need to know when you're applying to medical school. And then we're going to go on to my four step process for exactly how to tackle any scenario that pops up. Before we dive into the laws, one of the common questions I get is, what is the difference between ethics and the laws? Well, the way to think about it is that ethics are the principles that guide our decisions, whereas the law is the concrete rules that we cannot disobey. One good way to look at it is to think of medical practice as a playground. Now, the ethics are the area that which we can play within of the playground, but the laws are the fence around the playground from which we cannot go outside. So think of these laws as the legal written down extension of an ethical thought process. So when thinking about medical law in the UK, the important pieces to remember are the three C's. The first of which is consent. Consent is essentially when a patient gives you permission to do something. This might be anything from a medical procedure to simply asking them some questions, but it's them giving you the acknowledgement and the right to go ahead and do that. Patients can give their consent either verbally by giving you permission, say for simple things like taking blood, whereas you need written consent for if it's something a bit more involved, like say an operation. But the really important thing to know is that it is essential to get consent from a patient to do absolutely anything because otherwise it's classed as assault. There are four elements to consent. The first is that the patient needs to have capacity. That means that they have sound mind to make decisions themselves. The second is that it needs to be voluntary. They need to be able to do it without being coerced or you kind of forcing their hand in any way. The third is that it needs to be informed. So you need to tell them all the important information about it. So the risks, the benefits, the likely outcome and everything so that they go in with their eyes fully open when making the decision. The final one is that it needs to be continued. That means that they might have said yes, maybe a few months ago, but they need to be continuing and can still offer their consent today, say for example, if it's an operation, because they have the right to withdraw their consent at any point. This can be quite a complicated area. So I've actually made an entire playlist where we talk about all the stuff that you need to know for consent, capacity, and confidentiality, which are the three C's that we're going to discuss. The next C that we've already touched on is that of capacity. This is where a patient is deemed to have the mental acumen to make decisions about their healthcare. Capacity is a fundamental requirement that a patient must possess in order to give their consent. So essentially capacity deems whether the patient can be deemed to have autonomy. This is actually a legal concept that was created in 2005 under the Mental Capacity Act. And it states that patients are only allowed to make decisions about their healthcare if they are deemed to have capacity. Otherwise, if they are deemed not to have capacity, we are not able to gain their consent. And very simply, we determine a patient's capacity by their ability to to do four things. The first is to understand the information that we're presenting to them. Then it is to retain that information. The third is that they can weigh it up so that they can kind of analyze the pros and cons of making that decision. And then finally, it's their ability to communicate their decision back to us. The patient's communication is relative to their abilities. Say for example, you have a patient where the only way they are able to communicate is through a series of blinks. Well, as long as they can communicate their decision in their own way to you, then that is absolutely fine. For example, we don't just just deem somebody who cannot talk to not have capacity because they can't communicate by talking. We just use a method of communication that is suitable to them. And as long as they are able to do that, then we can deem them to have capacity. The final C is that of confidentiality. That is our legal duty to keep the personal information of patients private. This is a fundamental cornerstone of the medical profession and the reason mainly that patients trust us. You can imagine why confidentiality is so crucial because if a patient didn't feel that their information that they were sharing with you was going to be kept private, they might be reluctant to tell you some embarrassing or important details that are going to contribute to the diagnosis and therefore you could kind of see a situation where their healthcare is jeopardized by them not being confident enough to share the information with you. However, there are three circumstances under which confidentiality can be broken. The first is if the patient consents to it. For example, if they're an interesting case and you might want to share it for educational purposes, they can simply give their permission for you to do that. The second is if it's in the patient's best interest. Let's say for example that the patient tells you that they're planning to go and harm themselves. Well in that circumstance you may need to break confidentiality to protect them and stop them doing that and under those circumstances that is absolutely fine to break confidentiality in order to do so. The third is if it's in the public's best interest. So let's say for example in a similar scenario a patient tells you that they are going to go away and harm somebody else. Well in that circumstance it is okay to break confidentiality to alert whoever you need to to make sure you ensure the safety of that person. So now at the moment you've all been waiting for 
before, we're going to look at my foolproof four-step plan to tackle any medical ethics scenario that you may face at interview. So what I want you to do is anytime you're at interview and you see the word ethics or ethical or anything like this, I want you to straight away think to this four-step plan that we're about to talk about. So step one is that we use the four pillars framework. So you take all of those four pillars, so autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice, and you make the for and against argument from each of their perspectives. So we do this very systematically and methodically. We take each one, we argue for and against. Sometimes there might not be an against argument or sometimes there might not be a particularly strong for, but we just take each one in turn and discuss the issues surrounding that one. Step two is that we mention any pertinent pieces of law that are relevant to that situation. So maybe there's somebody who's on drugs and they might be incapacitated. So there might be some capacity issues. Maybe the person in the scenario is stated to lack capacity, therefore they don't have the right to give consent. Maybe there's a situation like we said before where somebody is placed in danger and you might have to consider breaking confidentiality. Step three is that you summarize all the key points or the main arguments that you've identified from your systematic review of those four pillars and the three C's. And then the fourth and final step is you give your opinion as to what you think the best course of action is based on the arguments that you've raised. Now the important thing to remember for this is that there is no right or wrong answer. As long as you're not saying anything wildly outrageous and you present a logical argument based on your knowledge that you've demonstrated in the previous assessment, then it's okay to have an opinion and not worry too much about it as long as you're backing it up with sensible arguments and good knowledge. And now I'm going to give you my one key tip, which is your golden ticket to get out of any situation. If you're ever unsure about what to do as the course of action for any ethical scenario, you throw in this line. I would consult a senior colleague ensuring that I maintain the patient's confidentiality. The reason this is your kind of ace up your sleeve is because it will always be a sensible thing to do and will make sure that you're demonstrating that you're working within the law and your capabilities. If you want to make sure that you're bulletproof come interview time, it's so important that you start doing the groundwork now. The best way to do that is to get as much exposure as you can to all the kinds of things that might come up at interview so that you've mentally prepared and you've at least addressed it once in your mind so that you don't get phased. The best way to do that is by checking out this playlist here where we've done some in-depth long form workshops to go through all the stuff that might come up as well as some essential videos in that playlist that's going to tell you some of the key information. The other one that I'd recommend is my essentials playlist which gives a quick summary of everything, the first video of which is here. That will really help set you in a good way and summarize everything at the start so that you can kind of get an idea of what's to come and then at the end to give you a quick refresher just before you go to interviews. So thanks for watching and I'll see you over in those videos.